The world is asking how this happened. While we don't know what ignited it, the first and most basic answer to that question is ammonium nitrate. The Lebanese Prime Minister addressed the nation yesterday and spoke of 2,750 tonnes of the chemical sitting in a port warehouse for six years without safety measures. The facts will be revealed about this dangerous warehouse that has been there since 2014. Ammonium nitrate is a commonly used chemical in fertilizers and in explosives. It's an oxidizer, which means it can enhance combustion reactions. Although of itself it's hard to ignite, it detonates if it's exposed to extreme heat in a confined space. Also, if it's contaminated with things like salt water or fuel, for example, the reaction accelerates. Because it's an oxidizer, it needs to be kept away from any products that might provide a source of fuel in the event of a fire, because the ammonium nitrate would provide excess oxygen. So, what was thousands of tons of the stuff doing in a warehouse in Beirut for six years? The timings and tonnage matched the arrival into port of a cargo ship. The Rosa sailed under a Moldovan flag. It left Georgia in October 2013 with a cargo of 2,750 tonnes of bulk ammonium nitrate. It was bound for Mozambique. En route, it ran into technical difficulties and the captain decided to reroute to Beirut for repairs. It's understood that the port authorities there inspected the vessel, deemed her unfit to sail, and the ship was held at port. After that, attempts to contact the owners and our charterers failed and the ship was deemed abandoned. The cargo was taken off the boat and placed in storage because of a legal wrangle over the cargo's ownership. This letter, dated just three years ago, is being reported in the Lebanese media as coming from an official who is demanding a decision of a judge about the destination of the stored chemical in warehouse number 12. If genuine, it means the authorities there knew of the chemical's existence. Six years ago, the crew of the ship, mainly Russians and Ukrainians, were also abandoned in Lebanon. At the time, they named the owner as Russian national Igor Grushushkin, believed to be resident in Cyprus. If true, chances are he would have heard the explosion 170 miles away. That is the minutiae of the tragedy. There is, of course, another deeper layer of detail here. People and families poring over the intimacy of lives changed and lives lost. A sports hall, which would usually be full of university students practicing their basketball skills, is now being looked at for a different reason, as part of the next stage in the race to get a COVID-19 vaccine. Why here? Why somewhere like here? Because we need large numbers of, of people to volunteer to try out the vaccine and also a lot of staff to deliver it. We need a big space. Um, the other thing is that I think because of all the problems with COVID has made people a bit wary about going to healthcare facilities of any sort unless they absolutely have to, including hospitals. This group are in charge of vaccinating 5 million people against COVID-19. Dr Jane Minton came back from retirement to help lead the research. There is a pipeline of at least six different vaccines that we're looking to try. Um, so it's known that even though vaccines can look promising in the lab, only a certain number of them actually turn out to be effective in, in, in real life. As the trials continue, the government are backing various options. At this factory in Livingston, West Lothian, a ministerial visit today from the business secretary. These guys have been working with this since what, April? He announced part of a deal to expand production to make 60 million doses of a vaccine when the time comes. But if a viable vaccine is found, how many people would have it? We've been given exclusive access to the Yorkshire and Humber vaccine team. They're getting ready for trials to start as early as September and they need thousands of volunteers. Professor Alistair Hall is the clinical director for this. Based at St James's Hospital in Leeds, vaccine take-up is one of their biggest concerns. 
I think we need to do some more work here at about 50% being comfortable with a vaccine at the moment. I think that's not enough. Um, I think for it to really work for people overall and protect those vulnerable who can't take it for maybe medical reasons, uh, that we're going to need to have, have a greater percentage willing to be vaccinated. But why is this figure so low? Hi, how are you doing? Other members of Professor Hall's team have been reaching out to the communities that are most at risk and are concerned about public mistrust. If I say to you kind of vaccine trials and that sort of thing, what does that conjure up in your mind? Is that something that you're yay excited about or like oh, a bit sceptical? Um, I think I'm excited, yeah. I think that, that comes along with some scepticism. Um, myself being disabled, you know, thinking of if they've considered my impairments um, and potentially how my body might react differently to other people's bodies. Ethnic minority communities have been reluctant to take part in the trials. Alicia, who works with the research group, teamed up with Black Lives Matter activist Dion to find out why. Distrust. Generally, the, the community uh, do have a bit of mistrust in, in researchers, and that's really understandable. Researchers had a really dirty history, to be honest. But it's going to take that trust, that um, building up people's trust and having that conversation and giving people information in um, digestible chunks for them to absorb. We're very keen to serve that population's needs for protection, and we think a vaccine is, is the way to do that. But if people are not taking part in the research, there's a slight possibility that there's a difference genetically or otherwise in terms of how people would be protected or react. So we're very keen that everyone who would benefit is allowed to take part in the research. For life to get back to normal, a vaccine is seen as the only way forward. But hesitation and scepticism about them will dampen any chance of us fully getting rid of COVID-19. Whoa. On the eastern edge of the Mediterranean Sea, a colossal explosion ripped through the evening air, leaving towering plumes of smoke rising hundreds of meters into the sky. It was a blast so powerful, the shock wave shook buildings and shattered windows far distant across the city of Beirut. The destruction is on a scale to match, centered, according to witnesses, on the port area. Cars tossed across the highway. Local security sources report many injured and the number dead amid the smoke and debris. And there are fears of others trapped inside the rubble of collapsed buildings. You could hear it. It was loud. The house moved and stuff. But this time it was different. We felt like it went inside us, like it passed our soul, the wave. I saw something bright and I lost my hearing for a few seconds. Even the, the taxi driver, he stopped and he, he looked back and, and the explosion just went up and all the glass in the car just fell on us. The health minister told local journalists a ship carrying fireworks had blown up. Though the size of the explosion suggests another explanation. Whether this is the result of an accident, an act of terror, or an act of war is not immediately clear. But the Lebanese capital is home to Hezbollah, an Iranian-backed militant group that is the sworn enemy of America and neighboring Israel to the south. It comes amid rising political tensions and an economic crisis that is the worst since a bloody civil war ended in 1990. Beirut is a city.